these is Disgust, and that's what I'd like to tell you about today. Um, so Disgust is uh, inherently something that we don't necessarily like. So I have a few warnings that occasionally appear before pretty gross images. Uh, we're currently, fortunately, just after the break. So you've you know, something in your stomach. So if you do feel that you know, your stomach turns quite easily, if you see something that's gross, if you see this, just look away. Um, so it's the first one. There's going to be some some examples here. Boom! There you go. Um, so, so this does is this uh, response to uh, something revolting, and the idea is essentially that it can be something um, related to contaminants, so bodily effluvia, bits of the body that should be on the inside are now on the outside, but also things like unsavory individuals. And I've had a, a smattering of examples on the on the screen there. Uh, and the idea is that this is sort of evolved in, in generally in species to avoid potential pathogens. And particularly in humans, um, this evolved kind of is a more or less cultural fashion where you, know, you uh, pick up your, your parents and your, your environment's kind of tendencies. And in humans, it created this really high strung tendency to really, really avoid anything that has a potential contaminating effect. So we, we tend to not even want to eat, for example, pretty nice chocolate fudge that's shaped in the, you know, the shape of uh, some dog species. So essentially, discuss uniquely human in the sense that it's uniquely high strung in us, uh, but it does exist in other species as well. Um, so whilst it is adaptive in our, in our developments, uh, it's not necessarily always in our current modern uh, environment. So one of the places where we encounter disgust is um, in some of our daily jobs. You know, if you're a cleaner or if you are a nurse or if you deal uh, with patients' insights, then disgust is something that is, is always going to be there. If you're a parent, my, uh, my baby is about one years old now, and I'm still not used to the, the, the nappies that are you know, sometimes profoundly disgusting, even after a year of daily barrages of them. Um, so it's essentially harmful in those uh, jobs that you know, require you to deal with it. Um, plus, there's a few psychopathologies where occasionally disgust plays the main role. So you know, in obsessive compulsive disorder, specifically you know, cleaning oriented uh, compulsions, those sometimes go um, hand in hand with a strong feeling of disgust and sometimes are inspired in you know, the onset um, by, by disgust itself. Uh, it can be a core in certain specific phobias. So you might have a, a you know, you might have some anxiety for spiners, but there is also this core of being absolutely grossed out by them. Um, and you know, there are some cases of PTSD that develop after particularly gory events. And as I'll come to show you in a bit, disgust is really hard to overcome in these scenarios um, because it's just resistant to the types of therapies that we normally use. It doesn't really respond to extinction very well. You can expose yourself over and over, but you just you know, can't really get rid of it. And uh, things like cognitive restructuring, another technique that we sometimes use in, uh, in a clinical environment, also doesn't really work. And this has kind of led people to believe that disgust is cognitively impenetrable. Um, and it makes it just really hard to overcome. There's some anecdotal evidence for disgust that, you know, to actually habituate sort of in um, students who deal with anatomy. Um, but even in them, there's a, a wee bit of, they get slightly used to cold bodies, but it doesn't really generalize to warm bodies or to other things. Uh, and another issue is that we just don't really have the data because disgust is vastly under research. Uh, this is a number of publications on the x-axis on the y-axis over time on the x-axis and the two things that really pop out here are fear in the purple line on top and anger uh, which kind of tells you something about the academic climates i think and what we <laughs> what we tend to deal with uh discuss this line all the way on the bottom and just for like a helpful context i put here the number of research uh, papers on bananas it's about twice as many as they're on discussed um so we've kind of under-researched this. We sometimes call it the forgotten emotion and um, still very much ongoing. Uh, plus one of the hallmarks of this is as well that a lot of this research happens through questionnaires, uh, which is, you know, can bring us really good insights. It's also fundamentally limiting because disgust is one of those things that really work with behavior. It, it's supposed to induce this avoidance behavior. So that's where we set out. And we, I mean, uh, myself and Tom Armstrong, who's my partner in crime in many of these studies. And uh, we have this pathological preference for really cheap eye trackers. So we use those in the lab and they kind of look at where people are looking on the screen. And we give people these types of stimuli. So warning, grow stimuli ahead. 
um, essentially we pair something neutral with something really disgusting and then we just look at what people prefer to look at. Seems very simple, um, but you know, nobody done it before, so we figured this is a way to kind of um, you know, operationalize this in the lab. Small note, these are not the actual stimuli um, because those are from standard databases that you're not allowed to share for licenses, so this is as close as can get. Um, now, what happens in the lab is that people do about this. So each of the dots here represents an individual looking at the screen. What you can see is that most people uh, avoid the uh, disgusting stimulus overall. Uh, there's some, like, some looks occasionally over. You could call that morbid curiosity. Um, but over time, if you quantify this, um, the green line here is the, no, the, the proportion of time you spend at the, looking at the neutral image, and the yellow line is for um, the disgusting image. And essentially, you kind of avoid the disgusting stimulus altogether. And this is for 24 trials that last about you know, 8 to 10 seconds each. So this is after extremely long looking at the very same images over and over and over again, and then popping the next book to another, you know, another set of images. And people just don't habituate. Um, so there might be a few things going through your head right now because this seems a bit obvious and also seems a bit fluffy and also seems like there might be some confounds in there. So just to run through those, um, there might be a few vision scientists in here. I used to be one of you, so I have, I have concerns about stimulus saliency. Like there's these low level visual features that make some stimuli just pop out more than others, like Taylor Swift, for example, uh, who is my standard visual saliency example. And in this case, um, if anything, the disgusting stimuli that we use are slightly more salient than the neutral ones. So that in itself cannot be a, a reason why people look at the neutrons more. You might be wondering, is this equal, is it a reliable measure, something that is important to check with every measure that we use? Um, X-axis and the Y-axis here are two different blocks, so two different types of images. So you don't expect the full correlation, but you do expect that they should correlate somewhere along the same line, because they do both reflect disgust avoidance, so the, the difference in gaze towards the neutral versus the disgusting stimulus. And on the left here is the self-report, and on the right is the actual gaze metric. Uh, and basically, you see that they are you know, equally reliable. Um, so that's great. Then finally, you might wonder, is this unique to discuss or is this something that you just see in all of the like high valence emotions that might be a bit negative? Um, so on the left here is this discuss data I just showed you in a, a replication study. On the right is if we use threatening images instead, where you see an initial bias towards the threatening image and then kind of that peters off to a 50-50 divide where people just don't really care anymore. Um, slightly different plot here, where on the x-axis now the time in trial, the different lines are spent just um, reflect different, uh, different trials in the same block. And the idea is essentially that on the left, we see that discussed initially, you see this peak towards, and then people just avoid it continuously. For threats, it's not really the case. In the first four trials here, at least, people kind of approach that more. Uh, another kind of high valence negative thing is uh, images related to suicide that we happen to have on hand, uh, which you know initially you see some approach, and then mostly just kind of neutral featuring away of that. And then sort of the empty disgust we find in more or less pleasant images where there does seem to be some of retention. So in sum, this kind of ocular motor avoidance is reliable, it's unique to discuss, and it's probably not explained by you know, other features uh, like low level visual salience. So back to the original question, can we use this kind of you know, approach to then see if we can uh, help people get rid of their disgust, help them uh, move beyond that? Um, so very simple, we basically pair this in a sort of associative paradigm where if people are looking at the disgusting stimulus, we give them money. So every four to eight seconds they hear a ka-ching and they get 25 cents, cents in this case was a group of American undergrads. And uh, this is before they see the, uh, so this is, so the same number of trials um, before they go into this kind of, you know, associative learning with, with monies. And this is what happens during the uh, trials where you do give them money. Um, turns out students are highly motivated by even the smallest of reports. And if you quantify it, this, is, this goes on for like 30 seconds, by the way. Um, so if you quantify this, uh, there's basically complete reversal. People only look at a disgusting stimulus now. Um, you know, they'll do anything for money. It's essentially what you learn here. Now, the crucial question isn't, 
does this work? The crucial question is, now that they've looked at that disgusting stimulus for so long because we encourage that exposure, does that have some kind of lasting influence on their avoidance behavior? And the answer sadly is no, basically a perfect replication of what it looked like before. So people snap out of it immediately. There's no lasting effects of that encouraged exposure. And at this point, we're scratching our heads and we're thinking, doesn't seem like we can impact the brain. It doesn't seem like people's cognition is going to change in any way, shape or form with the tools that we've known to do this in other scenarios. So we started looking elsewhere in the body and there is some kind of evidence that disgust is not only um, something that impacts you know, our, our cognition and, and our behavior, but also impacts some of the other organs in our body. Um, this is Jenna and Mendes uh, who show essentially that in EEGG, electrogastrography, if you put a few electrodes over the stomach and look at what their, um, uh, their responses are, it looks a bit like EEG signal that some of you might be more familiar with, but it's incredibly slow. And essentially what you can see is that if you give someone a, a disgusting stimulus to look at, um, you see a, a, a basically a difference if that disgusting stimulus is a core disgusting stimulus, bodily effluvia, um, poop, vomit, that kind of stuff. Um, interestingly, despite people responding um, on a behavioral uh, questionnaire and also on their like face uh, disgust response uh, in much the same way to things like gore disgust, so stuff that should be on the inside as now on the outside, um, you don't really see an EGG response to that, but you did see a heart rate response to that. Curious, we're going to ignore that for the rest of the time. The crucial thing is that the stomach seems to respond a wee bit. So we thought, and I say we in this case, because um, when I presented this earlier data, um, my friend and colleague Camilla Nord, who has an encyclopedic knowledge of drugs, came up to me and was like, what we really ought to try is this, this, this obscure drug called domperidone. And domperidone is brilliant because it doesn't really cross the blood-brain barrier. What it does do is kind of silence the stomach, as in it normalizes gastric rhythms in the stomach. So the idea is that now if we present disgusting stimuli, we might not see that same stomach response. And if that stomach response is somehow important, if we're monitoring that from the, from, from the brain, then you might quiet the behavioral response as well. So this is the basic idea. We take a baseline measure, we give people domperidone or placebo, it's all randomized crossover design, uh, so they get both and there's a week in between. Um, we're also blind to the whole procedure, also important to note. Now we have one post administration, just a standard um, same task as before. And then we do the incentivized exposure because we had an inkling that maybe the exposure and actually you know, having to see the disgusting stimulus is maybe super important. Also all pre-registered by the way. So when I say we had an inkling, I really do mean we had an a priori inkling. Um, and this is what you see essentially before and after non-paradone. So the solid line, is the domperidone, uh, the coloring is the same, so green is the proportion of time spent looking at the neutral stimulus and the uh, yellow lines in the proportion of time looking at the disgusting stimulus. And essentially they overlap here, so there's no difference between placebo and domperidone. Uh, this is before administration and this is after administration, so basically the drug in itself doesn't really work to um, you know, ablate some of that disgust avoidance. Um, the crucial question though is, whether the incentivized exposure works. And I, yeah, excellent. So there we see that it does indeed work. So essentially this is pre-incentive, so it just replicates those earlier ones. During the incentivized exposure, so when we are paying people to look at a disgusting stimulus, they again spend all of the time looking at their disgusting stimuli. And then post-incentive, there seems to be an ever so slight, um, slightly ablated avoidance. So it's a subtle effect, in fact, this is what it really looks like in these people. So you, you, you basically see ever so slightly more looking behavior towards the disgusting stimulus. Um, I'm showing you this just to illustrate how subtle the effect is, um, but it is statistically um, um, reliable. Uh, even on top of this slightly unfortunate baseline effect that we have. So blue here is the placebo, uh, domperidone in, uh, in pink, and essentially that is a wee bit of a baseline in the direction of domperidone, but even, despite that, even over on top of that, we have a, a decrease in um, gaze avoidance. So that's brilliant. It basically shows that this manipulation that normalized your gastric response um, only in combination with then exposing yourself to uh, disgusting stimuli 
seem to have some kind of effects on reducing the avoidance that you show on those disgusting stimuli. Um, so it's a kind of really um, cool causal manipulation of the gut showing uh, some actual uh, behavioral uh, response to it. Uh, so in conclusion, disgust overall inspires uh, really non-habituating avoidance behavior of any kind of disgusting stimuli, well, the effluvia in this case. Um, it's one of those few problems where more money doesn't actually solve it. Um, but uh, one thing that you can do is quiet the stomach, and that ultimately does result in um, the production of disgust avoidance. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, particularly Camilla and Tom, uh, friends and colleagues who are basically you know, the, the, the main people who make this, this kind of work super fun to do, uh, aside from the fact that it's also really funny to do. Um, and also uh, my previous lab, in particular Duncan, who allowed me to do all sorts of wacky stuff next to the stuff that I was actually supposed to be working um, on for him. And the bottom is a few funders who've paid my salary and some of the projects over time. And thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Edwin. That was disgusting. Um, are there any questions? Jack. That's a great question. The question for those on Zoom is whether psychedelics reduce your um, um, propensity for disgust. I really don't know, but I, uh, I'm going to steal that for my next funding application. Uh, that sounds just wacky enough to work. Thank you. Um, did you capture any um, facial information? Often disgust is associated with sort of facial pain. I recall back when I did work at St. Paul's that there were computers about changing the body and face, facial muscles, and things like that. So uh, the question is, did you capture any facial um, uh, data? Because that is something that we do a lot in emotion research. And the answer to that is no. What you see is normally there's a few muscles that respond when people, the, the kind of you know, pulling their noses up, essentially, that are typically described and discussed. There's a recent paper that kind of pulls that into question at how reliable those things are in general kind of emotion um, um, measurement essentially. Uh, it's not the reason why we didn't measure them. The reason that we didn't measure them is very basic in that we didn't think to do it. <laughs> and one of the other things that we didn't think to do, for example, is measure EGG while people were taking Domperidone, which you know we were you know kicking ourselves afterwards um, uh, because that would be quite crucial. And those are definitely things that are on the list of things to do next. Um, in part, the actual you know uh, neural response. The gastric response, and whilst we're sticking electrodes on people anyway, there's definitely also going to be a few on those uh, uh, muscles in the in the face. Okay. Essie, you've got a quick one. So you talked about this very basic uh, biological relevance thing. There's also strands of the research that show that uh, sensing Excellent, really good question. The question again for the people on Zoom is um, there is basic disgust and then there is slightly higher order abstract disgust for things like outgroups. Um, and I, I think two things on the topic. The first one is that with core disgust, there's a very clear behavioral and, and, and guttural profile of this. And also there's a really clear adaptive reason. Some people have argued that that response has been co-opted for more abstract types of disgust, for example, towards immigrants or towards um, there's a, a large body of literature on, um, on gay people as well and discussed towards those or the general overlap between conservative views and, and general discussability. Um, and for those, I, on the one hand, kind of wonder whether there's maybe a bit of a lexical fallacy going on, where if you ask someone, how disgusted are you by eating poop? And if you ask someone, how disgusted are you by tax avoidance, then you know, they'll respond in kind of similar ways, but whether they are truly describing the same feeling, despite us naming it both discussed, is a bit of an open question. Um, the second thing is that 
in particular outgroups and, and immigrants, sometimes people make the argument that one of the driving features behind that is actually pathogen driven because, you know, people from outside of your direct community might be bringing in pathogens that you're just not really uh, used to, and therefore maybe it's an active response to have some kind of disgust towards them. So there I can actually see it work. And um, it is one of the main things that are also still on my, my to-do list of, uh, you know, the things that I keep trying to ask people for money for before they laugh me out of the door because I show people poop. Um, so it's, it's definitely one of the things that's really high on my list to research because I do think there are some problems there. Thanks, Edward. I'm glad we laughed you into the door, <laughs> and uh, I look forward to discussing Taylor Swift with you again soon. Excellent. Thanks very much.